And now move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And can I inform members that questions 3, 5 and 8 have been withdrawn? I call Mr Pat Sheehan. Can I have a question? One, please. I don't want to give an answer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I am aware of the report and its recommendations, and I have written to the Chief Executive of NERTA to say that I would be happy to meet with him to discuss the report. The retail offering clustered alongside food, hospitality and entertainment enhances the overall visitor experience and creates opportunities for business growth, employment and increased visitor spend. I call Mr Sheehan for a supplement. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, could she indicate what discussions she will have with her colleague in the Dublin government to progress some of the recommendations in the report? Well, uh, I thought it would be wise that first of all I met with the members of NERTA in Northern Ireland first to discuss uh, the report to see what their take on uh, the report was. Um, of course, we recognise that the retail sector is a very important sector uh, for the economy in Northern Ireland, and indeed the wholesale and retail sector uh, is our largest sector in terms of both economic output uh, and jobs as well, and that sometimes is overlooked in terms of the sectors that we talk about. Of course, uh, as a department, we don't generally get involved in retail. Uh, however, in line with the economic strategy that we have, uh, we do welcome all opportunities to promote uh, investment in the local economy uh, and try to support sustainable job creation and uh, economic growth. So at all times, my door is open uh, to meet with representatives from the retail sector, and I have done in the very recent past. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister as well. Um, could I ask the Minister, just in, in light of the uncertainty that's already been created um, through the return of the Tory party to power, to absolute power in, in Britain, around the issue of Europe, um, would the Minister accept the key recommendation of the report? That, the, that a North-South retail forum should be established to bring together key retail business groups and minister, relevant ministers to ensure effective communication around key policy issues such as Europe indeed. I'm not sure the Prime Minister would uh, characterise his power as absolute power, I have to say. Um, uh, I don't think any politician uh, has that. Uh, in his gift. But in terms of the recommendations from the report, as I indicated to Mr Sheehan, I will be uh, meeting with the uh, Chief Executive of NERTA to talk through the recommendations and indeed to see what is best for the retail sector in Northern Ireland, because of course that's what I'm always interested in. Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Does the Minister recognise the need for town centre regeneration for towns like Bangor? that have suffered the lack of retail activity and the lack of investment? And what is her assessment of initiatives like the BIDS initiative, business improvement districts that we've heard so much about? Well, as the member will know, uh, the BIDS initiative has been taken forward, uh, first of all, by my colleague uh, Nelson McCausland and now by the current uh, DSD minister. I was very pleased to see that Balamina had stepped forward and had said that they wanted to be uh, involved in the scheme. And I think that that is a good indication of the uh, vitality in that area and what they want uh, to do. In terms of revitalising uh, other town centres, uh, the economic strategy does contain actions aimed at revitalising town centres. I have had on many occasions representatives from different chambers of commerce uh, right across Northern Ireland and most recently uh, Belfast Chamber uh, came to see me about what they believed was the best way forward for the city centre uh, and it really is very good when members come together uh, and bring uh, creative and innovative ideas forward uh, because obviously we in central government don't have all of the answers but we want to work uh, with local government and indeed uh, with the retail fora that are already out there. Thank you. And I call Mr Barry McEldoe. Uh, question number two, Kesh Tavrido. Uh, many members will be aware that my department has made significant investments in broadband infrastructure across Northern Ireland, including West Tyrone. Indeed, due to previous investments, superfast broadband services are already available from over 150 fibre-enabled cabinets in West Tyrone. Building on this, in February 2014, 
uh, my department awarded a contract to BT for delivery of £23.6 uh, million pounds Northern Ireland broadband improvement project, which will bring more choice and improve broadband speeds to over 45,000 premises across Northern Ireland, including rural areas of West Tyrone, by 31 December 2015. To date, improvements have taken place in the exchange areas of Ballygolly, Beira, Breedy, Carrickmoor, Castle Derg, Drumore, Drumquin, Donamana, Fintana, Gorchin, Mountfield, Newtown Stewart, Cyan Mills and Tulna Cross, impacting on almost 6,000 premises. Further details can be found on NI Direct. On 27 February 2015, my department also contracted BT to deliver the Superfast Rollout Programme, which will deliver superfast broadband services to 38,000 premises across Northern Ireland, including areas of West Tyrone, by 31 December 2017. This £17.1 million project has commenced with an extensive survey and design process, which will take several months to complete. Further details will be published on the NI Direct website as they become available. Well, Mr. Michael Duff for supplement. Well, I got to, again, Cordia, I'd like to thank the Minister for her comprehensive answer. The Minister will know that I organised a public meeting in Escra some months ago, attended by BT and satellite providers. I understand that DETI officials were to discuss after that meeting, uh, because they weren't able to attend the meeting, their input to all of this. Can I ask the Minister to undertake to write to me uh, detailing in an even more comprehensive way, drilling down to further detail about the various exchanges, what precise measures are planned for the 2015-2016 year to improve broadband coverage in rural West Tyrone? And I was delighted to hear the Minister uh, speak musically there of all those town lands and villages. It was beautiful to hear that. <laughs> Thank you, Member. I will, of course, uh, write to Mullow. I think I have provided him quite a lot of detail in relation to what's happening up until the end of this year, 2015. But uh, rolling then out onto 2017, we have the super fast broadband, and it will be finished by the 31st uh, of December 2017. But happy to write to him, uh, and if he wants to give me any specific issues that he wants looked into, I'd be happy to do that. Mr. Joe Byrne. I thank the Minister for her update on the situation in relation to broadband of West Rowan. Can the Minister assure the, the people of West Rowan that we will have a reliable broadband service within the next 18 months? And what can she say in relation to the other deficit that we have, which is the lack of reliable mobile service right along the A5 from outside Oma until six miles on the Belfast side of Dunyan? I thank the member for his question, and indeed, um, uh, I hope I have set out uh, what we're doing in relation to interventions in and around broadband. Um, in relation to mobile coverage, um, I'm glad he asked me that question because I had actually asked officials around that very recently because I have had uh, a few complaints about uh, uh, coverage dropping off in some areas of the West in terms of uh, mobile coverage. So I have quite a comprehensive uh, update in relation to that, and if the member would like me to share that with him, I'm, I'm quite happy to do so. I'll not go through all of the details here today because I, I don't think I would have the time, nor would the Speaker allow me uh, to deliver it all. But Ofcom are indicating to us uh, that at June 2014, only 1% of premises in Northern Ireland were in a complete 2G or 3G not spot. Now that will come as a surprise to a lot of people, uh, particularly in the west of the province, because we know that when we travel around that we often get cut off and we often can't uh, access a signal. So I have those details and I'm happy to share them with the member. And I call Mr Gary Middleton. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister has touched on this, but in terms of uh, many parts of Northern Ireland, mobile coverage uh, seems to be deteriorating with an increase in the number of not spots across the country. So what can her department do to improve uh, mobile, mobile coverage across the country? Well, indeed, um, it's not only recognised by ourselves in Derry, but the United Kingdom government has initiated uh, a £150 million mobile infrastructure project uh, which will attempt to deal with the not spot uh, problem. Uh, it is uh, uh, expected that the mobile operators, all of which 
are participating in the initiative uh, will take the opportunity, as well as dealing with the 2G problem, to try and future-proof their uh, equipment uh, to make sure that it can deliver on 3G and 4G services and, indeed, uh, beyond. So we have around 70 provisional mass sites identified uh, for Northern Ireland, and I hope that once they are, are in position, that, that will help uh, with the problems that those of us who live in the West have to endure. Uh, just following on from that point, uh, can the Minister give us an assessment of the effectiveness of the rollout of the 3G, 4G initiative and whether, when it is fully deployed, that would be uh, able to deal with the rural black spots in uh, broadband provision? Well, I think um, the way in which we'll be able to deal with that is through these additional mast sites, if they are positioned in the correct place. And I know that the company that uh, have been uh, employed by the government have taken some time to identify those mass sites to get the maximum out of them, uh, and I'm hopeful that, that that will assist in, um, in, in helping. But of course, there's always the natural topography that presents a problem, uh, particularly in some parts of Northern Ireland, and that's where our uh, future issues lie and whether we can deal with those. I suppose we'll have to wait and see whether new technology develops to deal with those issues. Thank you. I call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer so far. The Minister will have heard of the acquisition of the Windsor House by the Hastings Group. Can I ask the Minister what our department is doing is to, to encourage new hotels uh, in Northern Ireland and Belfast in particular? And can I ask, does the Minister believe that there is a need or demand for them? Well, I better answer the question uh, first. Um, my department, uh, in conjunction with Tourism NI and Invest NI, has recently reviewed its policy position around uh, support to tourism accommodation providers. Uh, the aim is to help grow and develop our tourist accommodation sector to ensure that it supports and enables the provision of sufficient accommodation supply to meet the demands of our key tourism markets. And this policy review has now been completed, and I intend to issue for public consultation shortly. The review specifically considers the need to encourage hotel development in Belfast and the potential for support through a tourist accommodation loan fund. In addition to financial support, Invest NI and Tourism NI offer a wide range of advice and guidance to tourist accommodation providers and can provide advice on issues such as IT and e-business and marketing, as well as statutory requirements and the certification process. And I want to see how quick you are on your feet, Mr. <laughs> Take two. Um, the Minister will have heard of the Hastings Group having acquired Windsor House. Uh, and turning plans turn it into hotel. Can I ask the Minister what her department is doing in terms of increasing uh, the number of hotels in Northern Ireland, but Belfast in particular, and indeed, does she believe there is a need and a demand for them? Yes, and I very much uh, welcome the fact that the Hastings Group have purchased Windsor House. I think knowing uh, the expertise and professionalism that that group ex exhibits uh, in the sector, they will make uh, a fabulous hotel uh, of that particular property. Um, the evidence that has been gathered uh, from the review uh, tells us that there is a lack of four-star and five-star hotel accommodation uh, within our key tourism areas right across Northern Ireland. Um, and the main concern highlighted in the policy review is that we may be approaching a position of undersupply of hotel accommodation uh, in Belfast to accommodate our growing tourism aspirations, especially with the opening of the Waterfront uh, Conference uh, Centre in 2016, that's just next year, uh, and research estimates a potential undersupply uh, of up to 1,000 beds by 2020, uh, and that is after taking account of known developments uh, in Titanic Quarter, etc. So, uh, in that context, I very much welcome the fact that the Hastings Group have uh, seen fit to purchase that property, and I do hope that uh, we help other companies to make similar decisions in the near future. I call Ms. Sandra over then. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a uh, for response and uh, the the information that she's provided there. Um, I wonder uh, how much do you, does she feel that this could be attributed to the relative uh, strength of the euro and the dollar exchange rates in terms of room pricing. Uh, and does she agree that all Northern Ireland the MPs should be arguing for a reduction in VAT uh, on tourist accommodation uh, right across the UK? Well, I, I do hope that uh, all of our newly elected MPs, although I do know that four of them won't be there to make the case for us, 
uh, but 14 of them will be there, and I hope they do make the case for a reduction uh, in VAT right across uh, the United Kingdom, uh, because I think it would help not just Northern Ireland, but other regional areas of the United Kingdom um, that, that, that have difficulties in attracting uh, tourists. Uh, I think that uh, the reason that we have this growing deficit um, uh, is really because of the success of bringing tourists to Northern Ireland and indeed uh, having some very successful events in, in Northern Ireland uh, as well, as she will be uh, fully aware. But the advent of the Waterfront uh, Conference Centre in 2016 means that we really need to deal with this matter quickly because if we're trying to attract uh, very large events to the Waterfront uh, conference centre, then we need to be able to have the accommodation um, to deal with that. And I hope that there are some business developers out there that see this as a, a very good opportunity. Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for her answers. Um, it, notwithstanding the, the um, good news in relation to Windsor House and the Hastings Group acquiring that, there still will be a fairly significant loss. Of, of beds or deficit in relation to beds in, uh, in 2020. The Minister has already referred to that. Is there not a more radical approach that the Minister could take in order to try and remedy that potential deficit? Sorry, I thought the member was going to give me a suggestion there when he uh, said I could be more radical. Well, certainly, um, as I say, we're going to put this out to consultation. Um, some people may come forward with ideas as to how we could deal with that. We do, of course, uh, have access to financial transaction funding, which we may be able to use if people are having difficulties with access to finance in terms of new developments. Um, that's something that we've been looking at in relation to the Grade A office accommodation um, in Belfast and indeed throughout Northern Ireland. So those are the sorts of ideas that I'm very willing to look at, but I'm not sure that uh, it is uh, an issue in relation to finance, but I'm sure we will find out uh, what the real issue is uh, in the coming months. Thank you. And I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six. I announced on the 21st of April 2015 that Invest Northern Ireland plans to develop a scheme to help ensure Northern Ireland has adequate Grade A office accommodation. This proposal to provide loans was launched on the 1st of May 2015 through a non-binding expression of interest exercise. Stakeholder engagement suggested that any intervention should be short-term and light-touch in nature, providing a stimulus that will allow the market to recover. Any scheme uh, would be reviewed annually, but it is currently envisaged that it will not extend beyond 2017. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister? And can I ask uh, the Minister how many expressions of interest have, there, have been received to date by Invest and I in relation to the scheme? Well, I don't have uh, that detail, but I'm happy to write to the member Invest and I would have uh, those details. I haven't received them in the department as of yet. Mr. David Michael and uh, thank the Minister for her answers so far. The Minister will be aware, obviously, that there is a, a large amount of potential space outside of Belfast as well, and obviously representing uh, a very thriving uh, private sector town like Ballymena, as I do. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister indicate what support um, she, her department will be giving for Grade A office space outside of Belfast? Well, there will be the same uh, advice, uh, assistance and uh, indeed access uh, to these loans for the people uh, who want to develop in Ballymena as there will be for Belfast or Londonderry. So the scheme is the same throughout uh, Northern Ireland. Um, we want to be able to make sure that we do have um, a grade A office accommodation right across Northern Ireland because I suppose it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation, uh, Mr Speaker, because if people uh, want to come and invest in a particular area and there isn't uh, the grade A office accommodation, then they will go elsewhere uh, to where they can find that grade A office accommodation. Um, so we do need to make sure that there is a choice for inward investors when they come uh, because I have heard all, from all sides of the House um, in previous occasions uh, that they want investment to come to their particular region, so we need to make sure that there's accommodation right across Northern Ireland. Come to Danny Kinahan. Glad to hear the Minister um, outlining the scheme. Does the scheme or could the scheme fit to the centre point in Newton Abbey? Because that would be an ideal location for um, A-grade office space. 
Well, there are other plans for a centre point uh, in Newton Abbey, and I know he'll not mind me mentioning that his uh, <coughs> predecessor uh, in Westminster was very active in relation uh, to centre point, and uh, indeed Invest and I have made some progress there, and there should be some good news coming out of there uh, in the future. And, uh, we hope um, that that will then start to push Centre Point uh, along, because it has been uh, something that has concerned us that it hasn't been developed in the, in the fashion that we would have liked to have seen it develop. Thank you, and I call Mr. Trevor Lunn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's question seven, Minister. I have met with a number of airlines to explore opportunities for improving our air access to key markets. Direct access to Germany in particular is a priority. However, discussions about specific air routes and airlines are of a commercially sensitive and confidential nature. Mr. Lund for supplement. Yeah, I thank the Minister for her answer. I take it from that. There's no point in asking her about a timeline for any of these discussions. Uh, the, the reason I picked Dusseldorf and Vienna is because, in particular, Vienna is well known as the gateway to Eastern Europe. So are there any discussions going on with places apart from Germany, perhaps Vienna or in particular Brussels? Well, it has always been uh, something that I would have loved to have seen develop uh, a route to Brussels, um, not least for colleagues who have to travel to Brussels because it's sometimes very difficult uh, to access Brussels, but of course uh, the traffic uh, is very niche and so there's not a, a big load factor in terms of, of planes. Uh, in terms of Eastern um, Europe, um, EasyJet have uh, announced uh, a route to split in Croatia um, and I'm just looking down the list in terms of other developments that have taken place. Uh, yes, Belfast International, the Wizz Air flight uh, to Poland as well is now twice weekly as well. So we are developing uh, a range of flights, uh, obviously, I would like to see more coming. The new KLM flight um, to Amsterdam, I think, begins now on Monday. Uh, so that's a very good uh, addition uh, to what's happening there. But to go back to the question about Germany, Germany is a, a priority market for us in Northern Ireland. Uh, it's a key market not only for tourism, but also in respect of trade and exports. Um, and uh, we benefited uh, in 2013 from 51,000 German visitors, and I think there's a, a, a very large potential in that market because uh, Germans, uh, German tourists uh, do travel throughout the world, and I just feel that we should be getting more Germans coming uh, to Northern Ireland, particularly uh, when you see what we have to offer here. Sir Alistair Ross. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister had previously announced that the Roots Europe uh, conference will be coming to Belfast in, in 2017. Could the Minister outline just how important that conference is coming to Belfast and how previous hosts have benefited not only from the amount of people coming over for the conference but also in terms of attracting new routes in the future? A, a very significant announcement. I was delighted um, that in a competition, I think, uh, uh, of six cities um, that we've been able to attract um, routes 2017 uh, for Europe to Belfast and it's a major conference in and of itself um, but it also brings key decision makers from airlines, airports, uh, tourism authorities and it gives them the uh, time and opportunity to negotiate, build relationships and then plan um, uh, further air routes and um, other cities that have hosted uh, European routes have had up to six new routes announced during the Roots Conference for that destination. So I'm very hopeful, uh, Mr. Speaker, that when uh, uh, Roots Conference 2017 comes to Belfast, that we will see more routes coming uh, into Northern Ireland off the back of that conference. Well, Mr. Danny Kinnan, you're obviously intent on getting all your questions in before you leave us. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I really wanted to ask the Minister whether she guarantee that the, the flight, the routes being considered are planned to fit to the respective airports and that we keep in mind all the time that we need to be trying to um, make sure our airports are competing with Dublin and that there's no bias involved even between our own two local ones. Well, there's certainly no bias from me in terms of, uh, uh, never mind uh, the international city, but also the, the city of Derry Airport. And they have actually worked together quite well in terms of uh, some of the uh, programmes that we have been working on them with. 
Uh, I know that the international airports take a particular view in relation to APD, which hasn't been accepted uh, by the executive. They have provided us with another report uh, in relation to that, the Mott MacDonald report. We are looking at that report, although uh, we have to say that there are some of the uh, statistics in that report that appear to come from Scotland uh, as opposed to Northern Ireland, so that causes us some concern. But I, I, I say to the member very clearly that there is certainly no bias, uh, and we work with all of the airports and because we, we want to see all of the airports develop and we want to see more flights coming in because the more direct access we have, the more tourists we have coming to Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, question number nine to the Minister. Invest in I has put in place a £170 million access to finance initiative to ensure that SMEs with high growth potential are not held back because they cannot access finance. Through the suite of funds, Invest in I is able to offer financial assistance for businesses seeking between £1,000 and £3 million over a series of funding rounds. The initiative has six separate funds, NI Small Business Loan Fund, Tech Start NI, Growth Loan Fund, Co-Fund NI, Development Fund 1 and Development Fund 2, four of which provide equity and two provide loans. And I yeah, I'll come to Kieran McCarthy for a supplementary. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I very much uh, welcome the Minister's response. Um, the Minister will agree with me, I'm sure, that the small and medium sized businesses is the backbone of the, well, the economy of Northern Ireland, and too often it could be said that when, despite all the grants that are available, uh, when they make application, there are obstacles put in the way. Will the Minister ensure that um, there are as little obstacles put in the, way, in the way of all applications so that we can make progress and provide for the economy of Northern Ireland? Oh, well, I want to say to the Member that I would accept that criticism maybe uh, in the past, but I have tried to cut down on the red tape um, and invest in I, and so far as is possible, because of course it's public money and you have to ensure that the proper procedures are in place. And I think of particular success uh, in that regard have been the uh, innovation vouchers and the finance vouchers, where people can apply in uh, for assistance and help up to £1,000 for small and medium-sized businesses. And there is very little form filling and very little red tape. Uh, and I think the small and medium-sized uh, business community have really welcomed uh, those initiatives. Now, the further up you get and the more money you're spending from a, a public accounts point of view, the more bureaucracy is involved. And I hope uh, I do hope that the new government at Westminster will look at this again and try to deal with some of that bureaucracy, particularly at a European level, because if uh, you look at the Horizon 2020 uh, initiative and the amount of bureaucracy involved in those initiatives is eye-watering, actually. So we do need to be able to deal with those issues as well. Thank you. And Mr David Michael Veen is not in his place. Mr Stuart Dixon is not in his place. So I call Mr Paul Free. Question number 12, Mr. Speaker. I do sympathise with businesses experiencing difficulty in obtaining grid, grid connections and understand the frustrations they feel. I recently met with those responsible for our infrastructure on these and related issues covering the whole of Northern Ireland. I will continue to engage, emphasising the need to find solutions. Any solutions need to take account of the current regulatory funding settlement, which concluded that asking consumers to pay more to meet developers' connection costs was not in the public interest. I should also acknowledge that our success in meeting the Executive's 20% renewable electricity generation target has made it more difficult to obtain new connections to the grid. I would urge any new developer to consult NIE's heat map before committing resources. For supplementary. I thank uh, the Minister for her answers uh, on this very serious issue, not least for my own constituents of North Antrim. Uh, given that NIE were given some £458 million in the last price review, and they have also received £46 million through the European Regional Development Fund, how can the Minister uh, ensure that that money has been spent in the right places uh, at the right time in order that businesses in my own constituents of North Antrim can grow and actually get some relief uh, by generating their own energy? Well, as the member knows probably better than most because of his uh, position on the EDI committee, it's not my position and unfortunately not my power to direct uh, NIE to uh, particular parts of the province. It is uh, a joint exercise with the regulator 
uh, with uh, the systems operator, NIE and the department. And that's why I have brought all of those bodies together. Uh, we had a constructive meeting when I brought them together and I do intend to bring them together uh, again and again uh, until we try and deal with these very complex uh, matters. It's not a one-off meeting, it's something that will happen now every couple of months. Minister, that ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the importance of the proposed A5 Western Transport Corridor for the local economy? Well, undoubtedly, uh, there are those in the um, region, particularly I'm thinking of the Chambers of Commerce in OMA uh, and uh, the business community in Straban, who have indicated to me that they would very much welcome uh, progress in relation to this issue. Of course, it's, it's not a matter directly for me, but uh, it was communicated to me as recently as uh, two weeks ago when I had the opportunity to visit the members' constituency uh, and visit McColgan's in Straban. And uh, again, they were saying to me that it would really assist them, particularly since they send out uh, a lot of product uh, down that very route. Mr. McAleer for supplement. I thank the Minister for answer. Um, can she confirm that this, indeed, this project indeed remains an executive priority? I know it is an executive priority, but uh, he would be better addressing that question to the Minister for Regional Development. All I know is that uh, it's certainly uh, still a matter of interest uh, in that region, uh, and people would like to see a decision uh, either way so that there was uh, certainty in relation to the matter. And I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, I wonder, could the Minister give us an update on the IRFU's bid for the Rugby World Cup in 2023? Well, the Rugby World Cup bid is progressing well. Uh, I think there will be further announcements made in relation to uh, how we're taking that forward in the very near future. It's something that we uh, are all behind and want to see happening because, of course, it will have an impact uh, right across Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It will be a huge event uh, for the whole island. Mr. Sheehan for supplementary. I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, given the fact that the Casement Park development is included in the IRFU's uh, bid to host the, the World Cup in 2023, can she confirm that that development is uh, an executive priority? I am rather amused, Mr. Speaker, that the last two questions have been about other ministers' um, uh, priorities. Um, uh, but as far as I know, yes, uh, the Caseman Park uh, development uh, is still uh, an executive priority. Thank you. And I call Mr. Barry McElduff. <laughs> Hope you're all keeping well. Okay, can I ask the minister for a further update, a further update on her department's efforts to secure land? to secure land in and around OMA for the purpose of inward investment. I understand that Vest and I have been actively trying in the recent months. Well, I, I, and I'm glad the member has recognised that we are uh, being active. Um, uh, it, uh, I brought an update to the House, I think, at my last question time, and unfortunately I don't have anything uh, further to add. But I will, after this question time, uh, inquire from the Chief Executive of Invest and I as to whether there have been anything uh, further, certainly, I haven't been briefed on any further uh, developments in relation to OMA, but I'm as keen as he is to see uh, moves on this. When I was up in Straban uh, uh, two weeks ago, I could see how um, McColgan's were really using the land that they had to develop, and I'm sure he was delighted to see the 43 new jobs being announced in Straban uh, just two weeks ago. For supplementary. Yeah, can I thank the Minister for her strong interest in Oma and Straban, the West Rome constituency? Um, following on from the review of public administration, can I simply encourage the Minister to engage directly with the local government authority, Fermanagh and Oma Council, and also DOE planning service to see if additional flexibilities can be achieved in the future for the purpose of identifying land suitable for inward investment in the Oma area? I said to the member, given uh, the makeup of Fermanagh and Oma Council, that he probably has as much influence on that council as I have. But certainly, I will uh, be saying to the chief executive and the director of development uh, that it is a priority, and we need to see more land made available for industrial development in that area. And I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Speaker. 
Um, given that the Ulster Bank's chief economist has said this morning that Northern Ireland's recovery has stalled since last uh, November, uh, which is very disappointing, uh, is this a blip or a sign of ongoing uh, difficulties? Well, I uh, thank the member for his question. Um, the PMI today suggests that our two biggest sectors, services and manufacturing, posted uh, solid growth um, uh, for the second month in a row. Uh, but some of the other indicators were less positive <laughs> over this past month. Um, but of course, this is only one survey, a very important survey, and one that we all uh, take notice of. But even um, from the point of view of the bank itself and from Richard Ramsey's point of view, uh, there are still other strong indicators, such as the fact that unemployment continues to fall for the 27th month uh, in a row. The job numbers have grown for 11 uh, consecutive months, or consecutive quarters, actually, uh, and that consumer confidence uh, is at a seven-year high. So, whilst there are some indicators uh, which cause me concern, uh, there are other indicators that show that we are still moving in the right direction. And Mr. McNary for supplement. Uh, I do thank the Minister for answer, and I have always recognised and congratulated and acknowledged uh, her performance as a Minister. But given, Minister, that we do have 20% of 18 to 24 year olds unemployed, and with 80% of those of the same age uh, earning less than the living wage, uh, on the news that we have had this morning, what is your message to young people when we do have uh, evidence of fluctuations in the economy? I think, first of all, uh, it's something I didn't mention when I was on my feet. First of all, we do have to acknowledge uh, the pressures that we are facing in terms of the exchange rates. Uh, there's no getting away from the fact that that is uh, an issue for us here uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I think it's something that, whilst we don't have any levers over, uh, that we must acknowledge and try to take action to deal with it. In terms of the uh, young people and unemployment in that respect, uh, we are, of course, engaging in our economic uh, and activity strategy, uh, where we're putting in place a number of actions to try and deal with what is not just something that has happened over this past couple of years. We have a legacy issue in terms of um, economic inactivity, and unfortunately, we are at the top of the uh, regional table in respect of that, and it's something that we are listening very carefully to, and it's something that we're taking action on through the economic inactivity strategy. Thank you. And I call Ms. Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, in this the week of the Royal Ulster Agricultural Society's Balmoral Show, uh, can I ask the Minister for an update on the uh, Going for Growth Strategic Action Plan for the agri food sector in Northern Ireland? Well, I'm very pleased to tell the member that we continue to work very strongly alongside uh, the industry. There have been some very significant announcements made in terms uh, not only of employment through the agri-industry over this past year, but also in terms of research and development. They have made uh, very strong strides forward. Uh, of course, we have announced the new marketing body. Uh, I note the comments that were made at the weekend in relation to that. Uh, can I assure all of the agri-food industry that the last thing I want to be involved in is trying to tell them how to run their businesses? That's up to them. We will try uh, and facilitate uh, what we can for them and to try and uh, get them access into new markets, particularly into China. And I, I know that the Dard Minister and myself are particularly focused on the issue of China at the present moment in time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that positive response. Um, I remember from my time in the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee that the Minister had appointed a go to person. A, in Invest Northern Ireland uh, with respect to Horizon 2020 and, uh, and to look at funding opportunities. But can the Minister outline maybe if she could uh, consider such a single go-to person within Invest Northern Ireland to work specifically with agricultural businesses uh, with particular knowledge in regard to funding opportunities uh, to grow specifically the farming sector in Northern Ireland? Well, the agri sector and the food sector is the only um, part of industry in Northern Ireland that has its very own division in Invest NI, and that's headed up uh, by a senior official called John Hood. So there already is uh, a person in place to deal with all of these issues, and uh, John uh, has been out uh, meeting with a number of agri food um, 
uh, companies throughout Northern Ireland, uh, and I'm sure he will be at the uh, Royal Ulster Agricultural Show uh, this week as well, which I hope we're all looking forward to because it's always a, a tremendous time for the whole of the agri sector to come together and I hope celebrate what has been a good year. Yes, there have been difficulties, particularly in the dairy sector, uh, but I hope uh, that yet again farmers will come together and we can engage with them and hear what they have to say about their industry. Thank you. And I call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what impact she believes a strong sterling compared to the euro will have on exports from Northern Ireland? Of course, this is uh, our, our main challenge in terms of the Eurozone uh, at present. Uh, a lot of our smaller companies in particular, um, their first point of exporting is to the Republic of Ireland, and so therefore they are in uh, a difficult place uh, at the moment. Uh, we will try and assist them, uh, but we hope that uh, there will be some equilibrium that will come about again uh, in the near future. Of course, for those people who are leaving Northern Ireland and going holidays to the Eurozone, it's a benefit to them. Uh, but for uh, me, uh, the export market is the key market, and it's one of the reasons why we are looking at other markets throughout the world where that does not affect us. Ms. McElveen, a supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can she give an update on the export strategy which is being developed by her department? Well, this again um, uh, is something that we're taking forward in conjunction with the different sectors. Um, as I indicated in my answer uh, to Mr. McNary, the manufacturing sector, um, I think Richard Ramsey described it as a, a purple patch. They were going through a purple patch at the moment, and uh, hopefully we will continue to assist them. But again, it has to be industry-led, uh, because there's no point telling politicians or politicians telling industry where they should be exporting to. It's for the industries to tell us where they want to go to, and then for us to assist them to get their export product to that particular market. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the work that the executives are currently doing in relation to maximising job opportunities in the foil constituency? Uh, well, I, I think the member is referring to the Executive Subcommittee on Regional Opportunities because, of course, it's not just uh, the FOIL constituency that we will be looking at, it's uh, other constituencies in other regions of Northern Ireland as well. But she is right to say uh, that it's that region that we're concentrating on at present. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, we looked at the work of Invest NI, but we also looked at some of the other factors as well, including infrastructure and including uh, connectivity from a digital point of view. So those uh, discussions are ongoing. I think it's a very helpful forum, and I hope it's one that will continue for other regions of Northern Ireland as well. I call uh, Ms McLaughlin for a supplement. and I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister then maybe to give us an assessment of what the emerging themes might be in terms of FOIL, and will we see a, a sub-regional strategy uh, for, for the city and the wider region? Well, I think one of the uh, themes coming from the North West is in relation to economic inactivity, uh, and she will know that that is a, a, a big problem in the North West. And it is my hope, and I, I'm sure it's the hope of the Dell Minister as well, that the strategy that we have outlined and some of the actions in that strategy, including competitive pilots, uh, will help uh, to deal with those issues into the future. I have to say that infrastructure is also uh, a theme that is developing. Um, the fact that some of the infrastructure, particularly in roads, um, should be focused in on as well. And I think that's something that's shared uh, with the Chamber of Commerce uh, in the city as well. They have indicated that as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for her assessment of the Jobs Fund? Well, the Jobs Fund has been uh, something that would not have happened had it not been for devolution, and it has made uh, a real difference uh, to thousands of people across Northern Ireland. We have been able to assist uh, some very small Jobs Fund announcements, as, uh, as low as two and three people have been able to have been employed because of the Jobs Fund uh, intervention, right up to large Jobs Fund uh, initiatives as well. So I think it has been a, a tremendous success, a success uh, for Northern Ireland and a success for devolution. I call Mr Douglas for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Uh, could the Minister maybe outline um, what the response or the progress um, has been in East Belfast in terms of jobs created? 
I don't have the specific figures, although I do know that we have made an impact in East Belfast as well as uh, right across Northern Ireland, but I'm happy to provide the member with those figures uh, in writing after today's question time. Question time for the Minister. Thank you, Minister. 